art story whisperers. In today's episode, we're starting to head up from the depths of the sea as we sum up our research on the Kraken. This episode is going to jump around a bit because we've had a few cool and interesting tidbits that just didn't make it into our other episodes. Thank you for spending your time with us, as together we've delved into the mystery of the Kraken, some history and the biology of the creatures the myth is based on. The art we've shared crosses the centuries, and mediums from ink to paint, wood carving to digital media. Thank you for taking the splash into these waters with us. We're ready to finish things up with a few stories that were just too good to leave out. So to start off with, we're just going to cover what exactly is a cephalopod. UC Berkeley's Museum of Paleontology's definition is, quote, cephalopods are the most intelligent, most mobile, and the largest of all mollusks. Squid, octopuses, cuttlefish, the chambered nautilus, and their relatives display remarkable diversity in size and lifestyle with adaptations for predation, locomotion, disguise, and communication. These brainy invertebrates have evolved several suckered tentacles, camera-like eyes, color-changing skin, and complex learning behaviors. Their lengthy evolutionary history spans an impressive 500 million years, and the abundant fossils they've left behind, mostly shelled nautiloids and hominoids, heated speciation and extinction events. From myths and their enigmatic fossilized remains to fantastic accounts of tentacled sea monsters, cephalopods also figure prominently in the literature and folklore of human societies around the world. Today, biologists and paleontologists continue to captivate the human mind and imagination with details of these mollusks' behavior, natural history, and evolution. Let's jump into a few tidbits from the digital PBS series Monstrum. This is specifically from their episode covering the Kraken. The direct link to watch the video will be in our show notes. If you want to get there right now and not worry about finding it on social media, just type in www.pbs.org slash video slash release dash the dash Kraken dash DZF76Y. Quote, we know less about the oceans on our own planet than we do about our solar system. End quote. And the first written account of the Kraken was by King Sverre in Norway in 1180. The king said that off the coast of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland, there was a large squid-like monster that was swimming and lurking in the depths. In Kraken... The Curious, Exciting, and Slightly Disturbing Science of Squid by Wendy Williams. She talks about the book Alex and Me by Irene Pepperberg about a communicative parrot, expressing thoughts on him not just being a talking parrot, but a thinking one. Here's a quote from the book Kraken, The Curious, Exciting, and Slightly Disturbing Science of Squid that may be a little out of the blue on cuttlefish, but relates to this. Attributes of intelligence seem to include the ability to learn from experience, to adapt behavior, to solve problems, to plan and to carry out complex tasks. Intelligence seems to involve the quality of curiosity or willingness to explore. All of these, many researchers agree, appear to be signs of this ephemeral and elusive quality of the mind. If those are the criteria, then cuttlefish seem to belong on the list of intelligent species. How large do squid actually get? Our friends at Wikipedia and National Geographic have our back on this one, as we're taking a stab at finally answering the question from episode one of the Kraken. Which is the biggest out of the Pacific giant octopus, the colossal squid, and the giant squid? So the Pacific giant octopus is found off the shores of the west coast of the U.S., on up into British Columbia and Alaska, to Russia, Japan, and the Korean Peninsula. 
Giant squid are widespread, occurring in all of the world's oceans. They are usually found near continental and island slopes, from the North Atlantic, especially Newfoundland, Norway, the northern British Isles, Spain and the Oceanic Islands of the Azores and Madeira, to the South Atlantic and Southern Africa, the North Pacific around Japan, and the Southwestern Pacific around New Zealand in Australia. This was taken from, in Spanish, Guerra A. A. F. Gonzalez, F. Rocha J. Gracia and L. Laria, 2006, Enigmas de la Ciencia El Calamar Gigante, from Cepesma, Vigo, Spain. Links will be in our show notes. The colossal squid are found in the Antarctic Ocean, but sometimes they are found off the coast of southern New Zealand. This is how the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tangarewa, shared the information. The giant Pacific octopus comes in around 33 pounds, a large adult, and they live only three to five years. The largest on record was 156 pounds, to what I could find. They are ranked as the most intelligent invertebrate. A UN catalog of octopuses sizes E. Dafleini at 180 kilograms, 396 pounds, with an arm length of 3 meters, 9.8 feet. That was from Jerob Patrizia, Roper, Clyde, Norman, Mark, Finn, and Julian, 2016, and it's a PDF titled Cephalopods of the World, an annotated and illustrated catalog of cephalopod species known to date. Then the National Geographic states the size as 9.75 feet to 16 feet with a weight of 22 to 110 pounds. So moving on to the giant squid. The giant squid can reach up to 59 feet, as per the National Geographic, weighing nearly a ton. The average is listed at 33 feet and a weight of 440. According to Wikipedia, giant squid can be up to 43 feet if they're female and 33 feet if they're male. This is generally thought to be attributed to deep sea gigantism. This again, according to Wikipedia, is the tendency for species of invertebrates and other deep sea dwelling animals to be larger than their shallow water relatives. Proposed explanations for this type of gigantism include colder temperature, food scarcity, and reduced predation pressure in deep sea. The inaccessibility of abyssal habits has hindered the study of this topic. So that sounds really interesting. So in looking at the Pacific Coast octopus and comparing it just with the giant squid, it's a matter of where they live and hang out. It, it sounds, sounds like, like it. yeah. yeah. Um, deep sea gigantism gigantism is really really interesting too if you are close to a computer i would recommend googling it because there are some crazy images of like the like normal like you know kind of animals that live just kind of in like the the ocean as we think of it normally and then when you go to their deep sea version yeah like side by side images are crazy especially there's one of a, a type of crab i can't remember and you can see it side by side with its more like shallow dwelling relative and then you can see the deep sea version and it's insane they're huge and they look like monsters like they're massive so it's really really interesting yeah i just looked it up i i second that and suggest looking it up there's some really interesting things the arms on one of these crabs is just crazy Uh and yeah yeah all around i'd say Give that a Google. That's probably a biology podcast thing to hit, but wow. (laughs) So, okay. The colossal squid, also known as the giant crunch squid, can get to be 39 to 46 feet long. So all in all together, so what's our answer? The Pacific giant octopus appears to be out of the running at a length of up to 16 feet. So it's a tie between the giant squid with a length of up to 59 feet, the average being 33, and the colossal squid with a length of between 39 to 46 feet. And so with that 33 feet average on the colossal squid, the giant squid kind of gets put in the running. 
So the colossal squid's length is between 39 to 46 feet. The giant squid appear to be all over the place in the ocean, while the colossal squid seems to prefer the Antarctic Ocean, ranging into the Southern Ocean to its north. Another fact that I thought was interesting from the Deep Sea Gigantism wiki page is that deep sea gigantism is not generally observed in the meofauna or organisms that pass through a one millimeter mesh, which actually exhibits the reverse trend of decreasing size with depth. So this is pretty interesting because it's more of a working theory than scientific fact since the ocean hasn't been explored in as much detail as we'd like. So I have a question about the big creatures down in the depths that grow big and then they've got these tiny things, and there's not much predation, it said. So uh-huh. what are they eating to grow so big? Or is it just the lack of pressures making them big? Or I don't know. That's that's kind of why it's more of like a working theory, because like scientists don't know what's making gigantism a thing. Like they don't know what's affecting the animals for it to be taking effect like that. Like it could be that like there's greater pressure in the depths. Um, It could be that there's like less predation and like they're not being eaten. Um, But it's also just like, how are the animals themselves sustaining that? You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I think it's really interesting. For sure. Okay, so the Kraken has only really to be accepted as a real possibility for about 150 years. This seems to be due to the sighting of Captain Peter. You did this on purpose. I have it. I have it in the next paragraph, too. (laughs) Captain Peter McHugh-Hay. Captain Peter McHugh-Hay and his crew on the afternoon of August 6, 1848. Quote, At about 5 o'clock in the afternoon on August 6, 1848, Captain Peter McHugh was guiding the HMS Dautilus through the waters between the Cape of Good Hope and the island of St. Helena off the African coast when the crew spotted what they described as a gigantic sea serpent. The beast was unlike anything the sailors had seen before. News of the encounter hit the British newspaper, The Times, two months later, telling of the ship's brush with a nearly 100-foot monster that possessed a moth full of large jagged teeth, sufficiently capacious to admit of a tall man standing upright between them, end quote. McHugh Hay, who was asked by the Admiralty to confirm or deny this sensational rumor, replied that the stories were true, and his account was printed a few days later in the same newspaper. Dark on top with a light underbelly, the sinuous 60-foot creature had slipped by within a 100 yards of the boat, and McHugh Hay proffered a sketch of the animal made shortly after the sighting. That's the end of that quote from our resource, which is the Smithsonian Mag. Did they have that sketch by chance? You know what? I am not sure. Let me see. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Oh my. Yep. Okay. You got it? Yeah, we're gonna post it. <laughs> so it's adorable. Um, it looks like Nessie, from what I can see. But those are just thumbnails. So yeah, we'll um we'll be posting a picture of Captain McHugh's sketch to Instagram, so you guys all can see it. And here's Boomer coming back through. In 1861, a French ship was sailing off the Canary Islands when they came across a giant squid. During the scuffle of trying to subdue and pull it aboard, the squid's head and arms fell off. Sorry, just, That's, like, you had it as, like, a quote, and, like, (laughs) I was like, okay, and, like, it just said that, like, during, like, while they were trying to pull it on board, (laughs) like, the head and arms fell off, and I was like, arms don't fall off. Like, did you (laughs) cut them off? Like, what happened? Yeah, they don't just, like, drop off. Yeah. Unless they were trying to escape, and they're like, bandage up! Yeah, they're all, yeah. every tentacle like, to itself. 
Yeah, like, it's not like a chameleon. Like, its tail doesn't just fall off, or like a gecko or whatever, you know? It's, like, yeah. so weird. When they are cut off, just as a note, in some of the earlier episodes, when I was doing research, they said that when a tentacle is cut off, because there's a brain, the not octopus anyway, in each tentacle, that they can still kind of be moving and doing stuff. What's the what's the lizard that tails fall off on? I was just informed that literally every other lizard oh. besides chameleons have tails that fall off. So no, we're lucky to have people yeah. that know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Chameleons' tails are actually attached. Yeah, they're they're meant to be there. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> So the squid's head and arms fell off. So weird. Okay. The French Academy studied the pieces of the giant squid. When Jules Verne found out about this story and study, he included it in his adventure story, 20 Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. So moving on, we're going to read you a quick excerpt from The Kraken and the Colossal Octopus by Bernard Huvelmans. So, how do cephalopods process light? According to marinebio.org, cephalopods have only one light receptor and are believed to not see in color. However, they have 20,000 to 50,000 more photoreceptors than vertebrates. And again, that's from marinebio.org. The Guardian says that, quote, research published today in the Journal of Experimental Biology shows that octopus skin contains the pigment proteins found in eyes, making it responsive to light. These clever cephalopods can change color thanks to specialized cells called chromatophores, which are packed in their thousands just beneath the skin surface. Each of these cells contains an elastic sac of pigmented granules surrounded by a ring of muscle, which relax or contract when commanded by nerves ending directly from the brain, making the color inside more or less visible. Octopuses are thought to rely mainly on vision to bring about these color changes. Despite apparently being colorblind, they use their eyes to detect the color of their surroundings, then relax or contract their chromatophores appropriately, which assume one of three basic pattern templates to camouflage them, all within a fraction of a second. And again, that's from theguardian.com. Thanks so much for joining us as we finished up our last episode on the Kraken. We realized it was kind of heavy into science and biology, but we did try and tie in some of the art that we found along the way that tied directly into these stories. It was kind of fun hearing about, you know, the sketch that Captain made, the colossal octopus that your friend Pierre did, and yeah. uh, the, the wash and drawing. Oh. This week, we've been thinking we'd like to introduce a new segment, kind of based on our public service announcement for water, <laughs> and just kind of in general to have a little thing called Little Joys of the Week. It'll be just something fun that happened during the week or something, whether it's something we like or an experience or something like that. So for me, it happened this morning. I was outside with our dog, Boomer. He's a half Shih Tzu, half Chihuahua. He's kind of bouncy, and he's a little blonde dog. We were out in the maple leaves, which about half of them have dropped off the tree. I was tossing them, and he loves crunchy things, and (laughs) he's been picking at all sorts of stuff. Like, with the fall happening, he'll pick up twigs, and he just loves to crunch things. So I was tossing little leaves, and he was just having a good time with the leaves. And so we played under the maple tree in the cool air with the warm sunshine. So it's just kind of a nice fall moment. Mm -hmm. My little joy of the week is um, since it's been getting colder, I've been drinking a lot more warm drinks, coffee, tea, just basically whatever to try to keep warm. And so my favorite has been uh, Twining's Irish breakfast tea with half and half. It's just so good. And I've been drinking about a cup a day. Just it's, I don't know, it feels This is kind of a weird word to use with tea, but like it feels hearty, you know, it feels Mm -hmm. like closer to a coffee than to a a tea for me. So I really enjoy it. I just think it's really good. And it has like an awesome like fall and kind of just warm, cozy flavor. Is this what we heard? I don't know if it's Starbucks or who. And we were trying to figure out how to. Is it a London fog or does that have lavender in it? The London fogs are Earl Grey, 
and then they do like half tea and then they do like half milk oh. and then they like they like foam the milk and then it's I think vanilla and lavender syrup in with their Earl Grey. It's really really good. That's okay. another favorite. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I was just wondering, so the Irish breakfast tea is kind of just a nice milk, milky tea that you're having. Okay, yeah. cool. So we're on Twitter and Instagram. We hope you'll find us there. Please send us a note on social media or at whisperingcontact at gmail.com. If you have any comments or contributions, we would love to share it with our other listeners in our community, and we are glad you're here. For sure. We, so, we really value engagement. If you want to help our show, leave us a review on iTunes. We'll talk to you again soon. See ya. Okay, we were a little derailed during November and apologize for the delay in releasing Episode 3 on the Kraken. Thanks for staying with us. One of the things I wanted to share with you was some scientific research about the giant squid that came from Dr. Edith Witter on the YouTube channel for the Vancouver Aquarium, dated September 3rd of 2014, The Kraken Revealed, filming the giant squid in its dark sea lair. So that's one to look up, and we'll be posting the link on our blog. The next one, we had mentioned Monstrum during the series on the Kraken, with Dr. Emily Zarka, as shared by PBS on the Monstrum YouTube channel. And it's Release the Kraken, Origins of the Legendary Sea Monster, from August 14, 2019. Quote, This massive tentacled beast of the deep has terrorized sailors and seafarers for hundreds of years. But with real-life giant cephalopods found in every ocean on Earth, is the Kraken really just a myth? We'll be posting that link on the blog. So one last thing on the Kraken. We invite you to check out Blue Planet 2 for some really great footage and information on Octopus. We're excited to wrap up our 2019 season, but we'll be back before you know it in 2020. The Whispering Gallery is going dark during December to give us time to prepare for our next season. Look for us in January 2020. We hope you take care over the holidays, and when something goes bump in the night at the museum, art studio, or atelier, we want to know. DM us on Instagram, or email us at whisperingcontact at gmail.com with your spooky art stories.